uh, for this very, very exciting workshop and conference. I know it's a start, and uh, I have to be very honest, I'm the first time here on the Bahamas, and I'm, I'm very thankful uh, to be invited. Um, I know this is a beautiful place, and the beauty is one of the topics I want to focus on beside technology. When we talk about water and about water in such a region, and I'm just coming actually back from Singapore, from the International Water Week in Singapore, uh, it's the question how we protect this nature, but it's also the question how do we build our developments and our, our sites, our architecture in a way that we find ways to protect, but also to make our own homework right and our places beautiful. And I would like to focus on that, on that a little bit more. Uh, I just would like to start with the beauty of water. One drop of water with a little bit color. If you look at these forms, what you can see when you just add a little bit ink or color, you see that one drop even is rich and full of design, of beauty, of uh, engagement. If we look at water in general, it's very, very, we, we, can, we can never describe water just by a chemical formal, formula. If we look at the dance of light on water, which is basically what tourists love so much when they come here, see the morning and the sunset. And we, when we look at the inner structure of water, when water is flowing and we just put a little bit structure to it, we have to say everywhere in the world, there is this enormous potential that water tells us stories how we could build. When we look at the beauty and the emotions what people have to water, when kids play on the beach, uh, we have to say, why can't we bring that quality to our urban area, to our housing area, to our cities? Why do we have to go always to the beach? Why can't we make our areas also more sustainable, but also beautiful and livable? So I would like to focus very much on that topic. Just let me go very quickly through some slides. Uh, experiments with water, researching on water, looking at structures on water, even in places where you would never see water, in the desert, we find structures and forms related which are full of life and they always combine function and aesthetic. And we can learn so much about nature and species like animals in the desert who take the morning dew just as ways to be sustainable with water. You know, there are many ways. How do we treat water today on our planet? We actually waste a lot of water. We are very un, uh, we are not very careful with water, the way how we treat it. And if we just look at different countries, you hear my accent, I'm not American. I don't want to blame America. I just focus on, on the countries where I come from, Switzerland and Germany, how much water we use. Not only the water we have directly, but indirectly, the virtual water we use just to produce our food. 70% of the water consumption on this planet is food production and that's also a, a way we have to consider, you know, what do we eat and how do we produce our food and that is a water question which comes finally back to every place, to any place, the virtual water. Well, we can learn. We can learn from other places, and I would like not to give an answer here, really. This would be absolutely uh, arrogant, because I want to learn also on the excursion how this place looks like and what can we do. But I would like to uh, share with you some experience on different projects and different approaches. Uh, I think we can learn a lot about urbanism in different regions, how uh, cities came up or how housing areas came up and how they have been very sensitive to the physical form, to the social component and also to reconnect somehow that what we have in religion or in, in spirituality, what is our inner outreach, how do we feel connected to the environment and what is our motivation for next generations. When we look everywhere on the planet, urban fabrics and urban settlements, they have ignored this. There's no time and no space, we get rid of water. And when we look at uh, the difference between a forest and a city, there's a dramatic different change. And I would also say that is the fact maybe also for islands. We lose a lot of water. When we look to, to, uh, to the nature or to the cities, there is a different impact to the environment. Evaporation is much less. Infiltration, groundwater renewal in our urban area is much less, and we can do a lot on that. 
I know there is a, a big controversial discussion, I heard this already this morning, on two positions, and I would like to focus a little bit more on that later. Just from the aesthetic side, we lose, we only see the water out there in the environment, and we don't recognize what we do to the water is very, very poor and very limited. And what we have often in our urban streams and our uh, areas, they are ugly. I don't took pictures from here, I'm sorry, but I heard there are some problems too. And it would be too naive, you know, to find suddenly ways of course harvesting rainwater in a small uh, context or uh, the other picture maybe showing uh, the problems to take them too short or too narrow-minded, but we have to change our way of thinking. And the thinking really starts to look at infrastructure, to think different about how do we use our infrastructure we deal with every day, how can we make it better? And I would just like to focus on that in a very simple diagram. That's what we see. That's what we see, buildings and streets. But what is underneath, actually, is an enormous intelligence about how do we deal with the environment, with the infrastructure. How does it relate to our culture, to the way how people behave or how people maintain it, and how do we manage also, uh, finally, energy and other things. And with that, I would like to focus on a very important thing. When we have money, technology, we build the infrastructure in a certain way. And here are the decisions we have to do. What will be the infrastructure and what will be the built environment, the urban patterns, uh, the built form, and finally, what is the post-process after that? That is very important. And I would just like to show to you two scenarios. One is we have capital and we build everything based on one technology. I took uh, reverse osmosis as one. I don't want to blame that because that's an important one. But if we only focus on that, uh, we, we need, we are depending on one resource, energy, uh, all our structure of cities basically can do whatever they want, they ignore it, and we come to forms which are finally very much sensitive, decentralized, and if anything fails, then we have big problems. Well, we know that there are many cities who are depending very much on that, and I just show one, uh, very much depending on one, only one technology, if anything fails, and we heard also a little bit about the problems we have to deal with. So I just don't want to say that's not a way to go, but it's a dangerous way. We should discuss, and this is really the forum, I think, where we can talk about this. We should discuss about also different ways, more dynamic, more decentralized systems, and that I would like just like to bring that in. And I will show you examples about that. Maybe less investment or more differentiated investments, maybe more finding ways of using different sources of water, also harvesting, recycling water on larger scales of cisterns, maybe, using also gray water, recycling water, much more. I show you the Singapore example where I'm very much involved in. That means you have to build different. You have to build a different form and the outcome of architecture has to look different. Finally, we also have to build in a way that we recycle and we reuse the water and also that means a different way of architecture. So that's a very important point. Now, I don't have the answer for the Bahamas, but I just would like to go through some examples worldwide where this is more maybe a, an approach which is more sensitive to the water, collecting building forms where you have fresh water and salt water in different ways integrated. Finding ways to protect it means also when you compare these two models that you come to a totally different ways of what it does to the environment. On one, we heard this this morning, we have to deal with uh, pollution, we have to deal with a lot of energy. We, ha we have a system which is very much depending and finally also a system which uh, depends very much on, uh, when we look at globally, that we have huge systems to transport or to bring food around or to harvest, and I include the uh, virtual water systems as well. When we come to our, a different, more dynamic and more localized system, we uh, have it more on the region, we have it more on the rain patterns what we have, we have it more uh, on recycle systems, and we have finally also a system which is more uh, 
probably more secure in the long term because we don't know what will happen with all our energy questions and many other things. We have a very sensitive system. And if you think about how our world looks like, this is just the last 50 to 100 years, which is nothing in time, uh, in a time perspective. If you think about environment, about how long it took to build this beautiful environment, what nature did. So these are the two basic scenarios. I don't want to make it like black and white, but it is a question of deciding in what direction we want to go. Well, i just like very quickly to go through some scenarios and uh, show some examples what my team did work on. Why not to harvest, for example, uh, the water in a bigger cistern tanks? We did this in Berlin, Potsdamer Platz, to collect all the wa stone water from this entire region, having rooftop areas where we filter the water already, where we bring it into bigger cisterns. I'm not talking about small cisterns, really big, big ones, using for this for different purposes for water, not only for drinking, but for different, uh, different reasons. Also storing the water in lagoons, uh, building up cleansing systems where we can treat the water to get rid of nitrants and phosphorus. Uh, bringing that to a very good water quality and also embedding that in an architecture which is lifestyle, which looks beautiful, which brings art also to that and which celebrates the water in the city where you can also sit and have tourists and enjoy. It's not just the ocean, it's also your built environment which should look beautiful. Singapore had this challenge very much. Singapore is a growing uh, industry but also a growing population, five million people now on this island, it's a tropical island. Uh, they have still 40% of the water comes from Malaysia by a pipeline. Now they start really to harvest their own water, to recycle the water. They have desalination as well, but they have four different resources of water to collect it. And we are working on a strategic plan and we do pilot projects, I will just show you one, very brief, uh, to have a program for the entire island, a strategic plan how to go for the next 25 years, how to bring architecture and infrastructure together to a strategic plan which is not only technology but which is also the beauty and also the, the celebration of water. We call it ABC water guidelines. A for active, B for beautiful, and C for clean. We also recycle our wastewater on the island, and we call it new water, because it's hard to sell uh, to the population water which is your own sewer water. So we call, we call it different, and we educate different. And it goes through television programs, and up to the prime minister, everyone knows, even every taxi driver knows this, pro this project on the island, the ABC Water Guidelines. Uh, active, beautiful, clean for catchment, for the waterways and the reservoirs to store the water in a large quantity. Well, that, me that means the built environment has to change. This was the situation, uh, the, old, the old paradigm, to get rid of the water in big canals and out in the ocean we just lose everything of the fresh water and it just disappears. Here we start to change completely the structure, to collect the water and to integrate it in the open space. So that means a totally different way of political organization, of management and of maintain and also managing finally also the finances and resources. We have to bring it together. We daylighten the infrastructure, we bring bio diversity back by working with bioengineering technology. Uh, we finally also have a very strong component and that is not only from top down but also from bottom up to educate, to bring people close to that, to bring kids to explain, to learn about the environment and finally to accept also larger changes in the, in the infrastructure where uh, places completely change and uh, come to a different structure. Well, you can do this in many places. Jianjin, polluted area, now completely clean. Why? Because the, the water from the built environment is cleaned. And we bring the clean water finally by a special treatment train where we collect it, where we treat it when it runs down, and we bring that water then into this uh, open system hold it back and then people can get close to it. So the aesthetic and the function has to come together and you have suddenly culture coming back and people really celebrate it. I think it is very, very important that uh, places 
engineering needs to be involved. I don't want to go it, it deeper into that. But what the main, uh, the main message is, the aesthetic, aesthetics of architecture in a modern way, uh, close to the emotions of people, that people celebrate it, and the technology has to come together. And that has many benefits. Even in industry or on sites, you can do this. I show you some examples here of industrial areas uh, where we collect the water, where we treat it. Here, the new car center for the Formula One cars. Even using the rainwater for an air conditioned system, for a cooling system, where we drop the water over a cascade and finally uh, have a, a, a way to bring it down. So, the, the entire built environment should be a way to treat, to collect, to slow down, to recycle, to reuse. And in the same way, you can make it beautiful. It can be a place for performance. It can be a place for tourists and local people. It can be a place to cultivate the water on the island and to bring it all together to, uh, to a final way. You can also include art, you can also include performance. So you see, I just opened the, the envelope or uh, the curtain to lots of opportunities to bring that environmental question really into the architecture and into the built environment. And I would like to open that for a discussion uh, later on and just my final uh, points where I was actually very thankful being a Loeb Fellow at Harvard for one year. Moisen, thank you so much for that and also inviting me for this. I just would like to say what is really needed is uh, we need to come to a more uh, sort of integrated approach decentralized structures, multifunctional systems, more synergies of design and function. We need a different process of planning. We have to be much more sensitive to what is the local culture. We have to bring a holistic perspective for smarter solutions. We have to think in a long-term perspective for service and maintenance, including the people also to take care of their own home or their door front and such things. We need to take nature as an example and find a paradigm shift. And finally, I know this is the hardest one, political leadership and courage to make a step. Thank you very much.